All the crew of the Light Feather were just about done at that point, but so were the stats done. Yeah, the scanner was still making noises, and it was only speeding up. The captain was about to tell the escorts that they were leaving, but again, he was beaten to the punch. Environmental hazard detected, area no longer safe, were the words they used. If it was an environmental hazard, then the captain was a Velian giant porcupine. But so long as the Statstan wanted to get out of there, he wasn't about to argue. The Statstan quickly hustled them back the way they came. The captain made sure he was the last of his crew to leave, and just before he got out of there, he took one look back down the corridor. His suit lamps didn't cast much light, but right at the edge of their range, he thought he saw, just for a second, a flicker of movement. When I say the Statston got out of there quickly, I mean quickly. Some of them were still loping along the ground, but a lot of them had slung their tools on their backs and were swinging from the ceiling holds. We, Armia, aren't exactly graceful on foot, but with wings not an option, the rescue party from the Light Feathers set new records for Amia runners. One of the engineers panicked and tried to use his suit jets, which are what the suits are designed for, but not in a confined space. Smacked his head on the ceiling, had to be carried back to the transport pod. Except the transport pod wasn't there. There was just an empty tunnel. By this point, the captain had had more than enough. While the medic saw to the injured engineer, he grabbed the nearest of their escort group. Now I said the Statston aren't intimidating, but neither are we Amia, particularly. When you're in the guano, needs must, however. The captain gave it his best shot, drew himself up to his full height, fluffed up his feathers. Not that it made a difference in the suit and he made sure that the Statston knew that when he said he wanted answers, he was serious about it. Malfunction in the transport protocols was what they told him. Well, you can bet that didn't go down well. The captain was not fresh out of the egg, and he knew there was more going on here than the furry little liars were letting on. So he threatened to tell the Light Feather to leave, abandon both the rescue party and the Statston, unless they started giving him the truth and he made sure they knew that if his comms were cut, the Light Feather would leave anyway. You know what their answer to that was? The treaties between the Amia and the Statstan oblige you to render aid to a ship in distress, because that's how they think. Rules say the Amia have to help, so they have to help. Never mind that any sentient with the slightest trace of self-preservation instinct would be running for the nearest airlock at this point, treaty or no treaty. Never mind that the Statston have been lying their fuzzy behinds off all this time. If that's what's in the manual, then that's what you do. They couldn't grasp the idea that anyone would say the hell with the rules no matter what the circumstances. Well, the captain had a comeback for that. The treaty says the Armia have to render aid where possible, and by withholding information, the Statston had made it impossible for the captain to asses the situation accurately and decide the best course of action. As captain, his first duty was to the safety of his ship. Until they told him what the hell was going on, he wasn't going to risk putting the Light Feather in danger. He could see they were debating amongst themselves even though he didn't have access to their private channels to know what they were saying. Then he saw the amount of EM signals his suit was picking up, and he realized that it wasn't just the 50 individuals in the corridor with him, it was the entire ship. All the hundred thousand stats down aboard were arguing over what to do next, each one no doubt wanting to voice their opinion without taking any responsibility for the result. Just throwing out ideas and letting the most popular percolate to the top of the gestalt, no matter if it made sense or not. Just so long as it stayed within the rules, it couldn't be wrong. No wonder they were in such a mess. Or, as we Amia put it, right above the guano pool with a broken wing. Did I say the captain was done with their shenanigans? He was well past done. He sent a quick private message to warn his crew that he was going offline for a few minutes, then he jury-rigged his suit radio to flood all frequencies at once. That got their attention. The captain dialed up his speakers to maximum to cut through the thin atmosphere and prayed the Statston's audio receivers had translation software. 
the Statston were just about having a panic attack. Now they were cut off from all their friends, so they actually seemed relieved to hear him speak. The first thing he told them was to stop asking the whole ship for advice, because those Statston in the Habitat Corps were not the ones who were going to die if things out here took a nosedive. The second thing he told them was it was time to tell the truth, starting with what happened to the transport pod and working backwards. There was still some chatter between the 50 Statston in the corridor with them. But it seemed like without the rest of their city ship trying to butt in on the conversation, they were more rational because they answered, Transport pod was withdrawn to maintain quarantine. Yeah, that's right. Quarantine. As you can imagine, the captain's gizzard just about dropped out of his boots when he heard that. And the natural follow-up question was, Quarantine of what? The story that followed was a little garbled because there were ten individual Statston trying to tell him the same things all at once, but the gist of it was clear. There was an alien life form aboard the city ship. What kind of life form? Where did it come from? All they would say was, species unknown, origin unknown. Whatever it was, wherever they'd picked it up, once it was on board, it started killing. The Statston responded fairly logically at first. They're a technologically advanced species. They should be able to handle a rogue xenoform. So they modified some of their repair box to carry impromptu weaponry. Their internal sensors aren't set up to monitor anything more than environmental data for the life support systems, so they couldn't track whatever it was accurately, but they could narrow it down to certain sections. They evacuated the affected areas and sent the AI-controlled repair box in to sweep and sterilize. The rescue party had already seen the results of that. Dozens of repair bots were torn apart before the Statston gave up. The repair box just weren't designed to take that kind of punishment, and it was clear that the modifications they could make on the city ship weren't going to cut it. That left them no choice but to do the job themselves. They printed themselves weaponry, based on their existing inventory of industrial tools and modified scanners to pick up trace changes in air currents and electrical potential. Motion detectors. They geared up and formed teams of no less than a hundred each to comb the ship for the alien intruder. The hope was that in large enough groups, numbers and firepower would overcome ferocity. The alien had torn them apart, literally. It was large enough and strong enough to rip a Statston's arms off. And it was fast, too. It always seemed to appear out of nowhere, and it was gone just as quickly. The other Statston would pick up the panicked chatter from the group under attack, but by the time help arrived, all that was left was body parts and burn marks on the walls from weapons that hit nothing. Usually a few Statston got away, they knew how to run and hide on their own ship, at least, but they were never in a condition to give any useful information afterwards. At this point, the Statston had started to panic. They withdrew the search teams and evacuated everyone to the inner core. Then they did the only thing they could think of to do, go back to the rule book. The protocol for dealing with infestation by an alien organism was mostly made with microbes in mind and included, as a last resort, Cutting life support in contaminated sections. Less effective when your target can move between different parts of the ship, but if you cut everything all at once, with everyone in the inner chambers, they open the entire outer layer of the habitat sphere and the spine and the engines to hard vacuum. It had totally failed. Whatever was out there could survive in the void. Of the first scout team to sweep the outer sphere after they repressurized everything, only 10% made it back alive. Utterly desperate now, the Statston had started pushing their life support system to the limit, trying every combination of temperature, pressure, and gravity they could think of in an attempt to kill the hostile organism infesting their ship. The problem with this was that generally the whole point of a life support system is to not let the environment get too far outside the norm so they'd had to bypass or disable a lot of the safety protocols, and even then the equipment could only be pushed so far beyond its baseline function. 
but they managed to get the temperature up to halfway between the freezing and boiling point of water at varying levels of atmospheric pressure. They also managed to get their artificial gravity up to as high as 10 Gs above standard. But this still didn't manage to kill the alien, unbelievably. In the end, all they accomplished was to completely trash their life support, so they were now sitting in a ship whose last remaining life support systems were failing with an unkillable alien predator loose on board. They'd let the crew of the Light Feather come over on a mission of mercy and led them right into the heart of the hunting ground, all without mentioning any of these details. Now do you see my point? Statston are the worst. There were a lot of things the captain would have liked to say to the Statstone at that moment, but none of them would have been helpful, nor repeatable in public for that matter. The most important thing in that moment was to get out of there, and for that he needed the Statstone's cooperation. He still had a nasty feeling there were more details they were leaving out. For a start, he didn't believe for a second that they had no idea where they could have picked up the creature. But they'd said all they were going to say and he couldn't stand around interrogating them any longer. He tried to convince them to bring the transport pod back, but the Statston with him didn't have access to the controls, and they made it very clear that the others weren't going to send the pod back while there was any chance the alien was nearby. Their only chance was to make it to the next section. The Statston designed their ships with airtight modules in case of a hull breach. If they made it to the next one, they could close the bulkheads and hopefully seal themselves off from whatever was hunting them. Unfortunately, the alien had shown a remarkable capacity to find ways to get from section to section in the past. They'd had to physically weld all the doors of the inner habitat sphere shut to keep it out. With the exception of one transport line, heavily guarded to allow maintenance teams in and out but they might be able to slow it down long enough to call a transport pod and get out of there. The captain finally dropped the EM jamming and gave the crew back on the light feather an update on the situation. He made it clear that under no circumstances were they to dock with the city ship, and if the Statston tried to send a shuttle over, they were to jump to FTL immediately. He made sure the Statston could hear that part. Then he switched to a private channel and had a conversation with the rest of his rescue party. The medic had got the injured engineer back on his feet. No concussion, just stunned and bruised. He'd have advised the engineer to avoid stress for a while, but under the circumstances. The safety officer thought they should abandon the whole mission. The captain wasn't quite ready to leave a hundred thousand sentients to die. But then again, the Statstom's problems could wait until all his team were back on the light feather. The Statstom, meanwhile, were having a discussion of their own. Or an argument, rather. Seemed like the others weren't happy that the escorts had let slip their little secret. They're not like the Kalu Kamsku. They knew full well they should have disclosed the danger to the light feather. They just didn't want to risk the Amy and not helping them. They were very clear on what they wanted to happen now, though, and the escorts relayed the results of their deliberations to the rescue team. Evacuate the city ship, then overload the reactors. Result? Thermonuclear explosion. It's the only way to be sure. The captain actually liked the idea of nuking the Statstan ship a whole lot at this point, but the problem was carrying out an evacuation without giving the alien a chance to board the light feather. They could cross that branch when they got to it, though. Right now, getting the hell out of there was their top priority. Unfortunately, that meant making their way through several hundred meters of pitch-black corridors. The only idea the captain liked the sound of less was staying right where they were. The motion detector hadn't made any noise for a while. Maybe the alien had decided that with twelve Amia among the fifty stats stun, the odds were against it. Or maybe it just wasn't moving. The captain cast one last look down the corridor, but his suit lights didn't show much. If there was something out there, waiting, well, either way it didn't make a difference. They were putting as much distance between themselves and this section as possible. They took a left and followed the monorail for the transport pods a little way before it disappeared into a tunnel. The escorts advised against following it. Once you were in the tunnel, there was no way out until you got to the other end. So they took another left, which led them through a corridor where the artificial gravity was malfunctioning. 
The Armia, of course, were fairly comfortable with weightlessness, but the Statsdan did not take well to bobbing about and would only proceed clinging to the walls and ceiling. This slowed them down a lot. The captain tensed up, what he wouldn't have given for something thick and heavy to hide under at that moment. But he had a duty to his crew, and hiding wasn't going to do them any good here anyway. They had to make it to the next section and seal the bulkheads. At least the Statston were moving faster now. They were clumsy in the low gravity, but although a couple of them lost their grip and bounced off the floor, they kept going. There was definitely something behind them, moving fast, closing on them. But they still had time. The captain turned, trying to see where it was. His suit lights glanced across the walls, floor, ceiling, but they didn't show him anything but an empty corridor. They were almost at the end of the corridor. It couldn't be that much further to the next section. The captain checked all his crew were ahead of him. They were at the end of the corridor, all of them. The gravity was back. This part still had power. They were at a four-way intersection, and the Statston had paused, trying to work out which fork to take. The motion sensor wasn't picking up anything. Maybe whatever was following them didn't like low gravity. The captain spun round, just in time to see a vent cover slam to the ground something dropped from the shaft right into the middle of them. The captain just caught a glimpse of it in the light of someone else's suit lamps. Whatever it was, it was fast, and it was bone white. Everyone panicked. Some of the Statston dived for cover, some brought their weapons up. The ones who fled were the smart ones. In all the chaos, the captain couldn't keep track of the white blur. But he saw a Statston go flying and hit the wall, hard. Every radio channel was filled with shouting, screaming, it was just as well atmospheric pressure was low, muffling the sound of fifty Statston shrieking in alarm. Several of the Amio tried to activate their suit jets on instinct. One or two got clear, but the captain saw a couple of his crew smack into the ceiling or bounce off the walls. The safety officer kept his cool like he'd been trained to and retreated back into zero-G section where an Amio would have an advantage. The medic managed not to panic as well, and made for an engineer who'd been knocked down. The creature grabbed him. Through the mess of flailing Statston and Amia, the captain just managed to catch a glimpse of a red suit being dragged into a ventilation shaft. Then it was over. The whole encounter had lasted less than thirty seconds. <laughs>